Hue, which is in the middle of the country, is visited by more and more tourists. The city began to flourish at the end of the 19th century when the Nguyen dynasty moved its capital here. Despite the fact that during their reign the country lost its independence and became a French colony, Hue flourished until 1945. That year, the last Vietnamese emperor, Bao Dai, resigned. Hue's main attraction is the emperor's city, or forbidden city, as it used to be called. Today, it's allowed to enter it, although it's true that there isn't much to see. The imperial building, built of wood on a stone base, burnt down during a fire in 1947. In 1968, Hue was able to make a stand against the siege of America for 25 days, which also dealt a blow to the monuments. Some pagodas, halls, and other buildings in the old city have since been reconstructed. As the stone bases of the palace are undamaged, and the plans as well as some drawings and photographs have survived, we can hope that the wooden palace will regain its old brilliance by the time reconstruction has been finished. The Forbidden City was really city-sized. It was surrounded by conduit and high walls. The main gate had five entrances. The middle one was used only by the emperor. Two smaller ones were used by officials, mandarins, and soldiers. The two huge gates on the sides were for the emperor's elephants. Ceremonies took place in the first courtyard, the officials standing according to their positions, greeting the emperor. The Supreme Harmony Room was used at more solemn ceremonies. Coronations took place here, and this was where envoys from abroad were welcomed. The Purple Palace was the private suite of the Emperor and his family. Besides them, only the most important servants were allowed to enter here, including the concubines with their guards, eunuchs, the cooks, servers, cleaners, and court musicians, as well as the actors acting in the theater of the Purple Palace. Thus, this group of servants consisted of hundreds of people. The size of the Purple Palace was accordingly big. The nine-meter walls surrounded an approximately 300 by 300 meter area. Inside the walls, palaces, terraces, halls, pavilions, gardens, and theaters could be found. Emperor Jia Long's palace stood here for 141 years, its former pomp can be imagined only with the help of the informative signs. Being a concubine was not all that luxurious as it may seem to be. It's true that the chosen girl was given everything. Even more, she could support her family as well. But she wasn't allowed to meet her relatives, and she needed a special permission to meet and speak to her mother only from behind a bamboo screen. If she fell ill, the doctor wasn't allowed to talk to her and was only allowed to feel her pulse. There were nine classes of concubines whose clothes were different according to this ranking. Newcomers first had to acquire the etiquette of the court. In the first half year, they didn't dare to say a word, lest they make a mistake. The emperor's officials, in the interest of their own progress, often offered their daughters of their own accord. On the riverbank, outside the walls of the Emperor's city, a pleasant park can be found, flanked by hotels and restaurants. The old city is called Citadel, although it was never a citadel, and hardly anything of it can be seen. But on its flag tower, the red flag with yellow stars flies proudly, and its friendly streets invite us for a walk. Emperor Tuduk is recorded to have had 104 concubines guarded by eunuchs. We don't know how many of them he really used. His successor, Min Mang, is recorded to have slept with five women each night, the result of which was 142 children produced by him. In the theater, classical Chinese plays were performed to entertain the emperor. After lunch, five concubines fulfilled his every wish. One of them prepared his tobacco for him, another one sang, another fanned him. 
The Emperor's meals consisted of 50 courses every day, which were made by 50 cooks. Rice was sorted grain by grain, and of course there were people who tasted the dishes before serving. The descendants of the Emperor's cooks still live in Hui, so in the restaurants here, we can find some really enjoyable special dishes. There's no one to taste test before us, but there probably isn't anyone who would like to poison us. By all means, we should have a look at the bronze urns as tall as a human being, symbolizing the power of the Niguyen Naidisti. They survived the centuries safely. The nine urns weigh 2.5 tons each. Each was dedicated to an emperor and was decorated with carvings depicting landscapes, the moon, the sun, and the clouds. The monarchs of the Nguyen dynasty are buried in the cemetery known as the Emperor Tombs of Hui, south of the city. The ruinous cemetery is part of the world heritage and is being renovated. The fourth emperor of the dynasty, Tuduk, was a philosopher, historian, and poet who wrote 4,000 poems. He planned his own tomb complex on a small island of a pond. The curiosity of the lavish tomb is that the emperor's carved sarcophagus is empty. It isn't known where the emperor really rests because the 100 servants taking part in his funeral were executed. The market in Hui meets the everyday needs of the people living here and it isn't a place made for tourists. Maybe that's why it's interesting. Coconuts, mangoes, bananas, and pineapples are sold by their growers, but there are also pots and pans, household commodities, and flowers. At the market, skillful women make incense sticks of various scents which are well known all over the world. Other craftsmen make various hats of raffia, cane, and bamboo. The sculptors also make their work of various materials and subjects in front of our eyes. The majority of the statues made of porcelain, clay, and wood depict Buddha and known figures of Vietnamese tales and legends. Phum, that is the fragrant river which flows through Hue, is the third most important river in Vietnam. By boat, we can approach the famous Emperor Tombs. The tomb of the founder of the Nguyen dynasty, Gia Long, was built on one of the small islands of the river. The tomb of Min Lang, who had 33 wives, countless concubines, and 142 children, was built in a huge park according to the maxims of classical Chinese architecture. The tomb of his son, Tiu Tri, can be found nearby, which is like a miniature of his father's. Experts think Kai Dean's tomb mixes the features of Vietnamese and European styles in the most beautiful way. The Tian Mu Pagoda was established at the beginning of the 1600s. The 21-meter-high, seven-story building with an octagon-shaped ground plan was built in 1844 and can be seen even today. The legend says the founder Nguyen Huang met an old woman who told him to go east along the river Parfum and take an incense stick with him. He should build a pagoda at the place where it burnt out. And so he did. The Tian Mu Pagoda is famous for being the center of the opposition movement in the 1960s. 
In 1963, Thich Quang Duc burned himself to death to protest against the measures of the Vietnamese president. The photos taken of his protest traveled throughout the world press. Today, everything is much more peaceful. Monks with heads shaven bald wearing crocus yellow and light blue gowns and apprentices walk among the walls, which have witnessed a lot. We pass ships decorated with colorful dragon heads and depicting sea snakes and other monsters, and we go on coasting towards the southeast, towards Hoi An. The coast of Hoi An is four kilometers from the city on the east. We can reach here by taking part in an organized trip, but we can go by sea float. In the waters on the coast, fishermen can expect an abundant catch. In the sea, they can catch herring and mackerel and sawfish, but the fresh water is also full of fish. There are a lot of kinds of crabs and turtles, which are often seen in the kitchens. On the coast, we can often encounter otters, which are water mammals with shiny fur. Among reptiles, Geckos and lizards are worth mentioning. Both are very useful as they eat mosquitoes and flies, so they protect us from many inconveniences. The beach gives us all the facilities that the beaches in Southeast Asia usually do, including diving. Two big companies deal with diving instruction, lending necessary equipment, and guiding tourists. We can hire a surfboard, boat, or catamaran. We have to pay for a deck chair and parasols, but they don't cost much. Hoi on sandy beach with palm trees lies where Tokini Bay meets the South China Sea. This side sea of the Pacific Ocean attracts bathers with its friendly turquoise blue water, pleasant temperature, and spectacular snow white waves. On the beach, those obsessed with sunbathing can lie, while a little further from the beach, coconut palms offer welcome shade. The yellow, orange, blood red, purple, and gold play of light and the soft darkness over the sea provide us with an unforgettable sight, just like the tiny colorful lamps floating on the sea.